You are invited to stand for the call to worship as you're able. I will bless the Lord at all times. We will bless our God at all times. I will praise the Holy One with my voice. Let us exalt God's name together. We are seeking, and God will answer us. We cry out for help, and God will deliver us. So come now, let us worship together. Let us taste and see that our God is good. In the name of God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer, we greet you whether you're here looking back at me in the sanctuary, whether you're watching on the live stream, whether you're listening on the radio or on the dial-in phone option. We are so grateful that you have taken a moment to join us, even if it is sometime in the future and you're listening back on us right now. What a gift it is through the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to connect with one another in this moment. One thing that I have missed since being back together is an opportunity to pass the peace. But here's what I'm going to ask, that as we do it, recognizing that we're all in a place that is different in terms of our comfortability, in terms of touch, that for now, 
we not touch one another in this moment, but that we take this moment to see each other face to face and greet one another with signs of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. and your voices with mine in our prayer of confession. Mystical, transcendent God, there is so much of life we simply do not know. In our arrogance, we utter what we do not understand. Rescue us, O Lord, from our afflictions. Restore us, O God, from our self-inflicted wounds. Have mercy on us, Son of David, Son of God. In your limitless compassion, save us. Cry out to Christ, our great high priest, for he has saved us. Our faith has made us well, brought us forgiveness, and granted us peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. is an outreach Sunday. I would invite David Kennedy to the lectern for this moment for our minute for mission as he tells us a little bit about Habitat for Humanity. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning. For almost 25 years, the people of Asbury have supported Flower City Habitat for Humanity with their gifts of time and treasure. In collaboration with other churches in the Harvest Home Coalition, Asbury people have contributed to the construction of many homes, including 757 J Street, which should be completed early next year. Currently, Habitat has four homes under construction, bringing their total to 250 affordable homes in Rochester. Your contributions to Habitat support affordable housing for our lower income working neighbors. An affordable Habitat home is built with volunteer labor, is sold at a reasonable price, 
and is financed with a very low interest rate mortgage. Habitat is a hand up, not a hand out. You can support Habitat's efforts financially with your purchase of a delicious pie in the welcome hall from John Small, with your volunteer construction labor on our next workday, please see me or Paula Kempel, or with your purchase of a treasure from the Habitat Restores on Culver Road or East Henrietta Road. Thank you very much. Hear the word of the Lord this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho, and as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart. Get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, and he loves each and every one of you too. I, at this time, I invite the children forward for children's time. As they come forward, I want the families to know they are more than welcome to worship with you, or they can go with Miss Holly and myself to the second floor Sunday school wing for some time of enrichment. Come on down, kids. It is so good to see you, and the people that are watching would love to see you too. So turn around and wave, and a special hello to the Ekman family in California. All right. I want today to introduce you to a friend of mine. His name was Eli Ekman. Look at this sweet little boy. He was just like you. He loved to come to church every Sunday and sit right where you are for children's time. But he was different than you. He could not walk up here. He had a real fancy wheelchair. And his eyes didn't work like your eyes. He was blind. He couldn't see. But you know what? His eyes still sparkled with love and joy. Eli has a mom, Ashley, and a dad, Brian, and these are his two brothers, Sam and Will. Eli, 12 years ago, passed away, and he is in heaven now with God and Jesus. But the spirit of Eli still lives with us here. The next time you are in our church library, there is a book written by Cheryl Thompson and her son, Brennan. They were so inspired by Eli, they wrote Eli's Rainbow. Even though Eli could not see, he knew all his colors. And this book explains how he knew colors, like red was a strawberry on a warm, sunny day. So check that out at the library. The next time you get on the elevator, look to your left. There's a sign saying, this is Eli's elevator. It was dedicated to Eli when he passed away because Eli needed an elevator to get to Sunday school. And when you go out to your car, look to the far end of the education wing, you're going to see this giant, beautiful butterfly bush. Underneath that bush is a bench, Eli's bench. Go sit on his bench and think about Eli. Think about his family. Next to the bench is a beautiful wind chime. Eli loved wind chimes. I tell you about Eli today because when I read the scripture of the healing of the blind man, I thought about Eli. He was probably the person I was closest to that was blind. So I gave his mom, Ashley, a call and just made sure that I could have a picture of Eli and hear how her family was doing. Another thing when I was reading the scripture, I thought about the miracle of making someone be able to see. And I wondered really, is that miracle just for that one man who couldn't see and asked for a miracle? Or could it be that that miracle was really for all of us, because all of us sometimes are blinded and can't see some of the suffering in this world. We turn, the expression is we turn a blind eye to it. But you know what the good news is, my friends? You are in a beautiful place, because for sure Asbury does not turn a blind eye to those who are suffering. This month, when we're focusing on our outreach, that's exactly what we do. And some of you at Sunday school helped already. You brought in some clothes that don't fit you anymore, and we walked them right over to the storehouse. See, we are blessed. 
We've had a miracle here. We know that our job as Christians, our job as following Jesus, is to help those who are suffering, who are suffering in silence, that we will be there for them. That is our job. So with that in mind, let's close with a prayer and we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Dear God, thank you for Eli Ekman. Thank you for bringing him into our lives here at Asbury and for him making changes in all of us. Thank you for the gift of being able to be outreachers, to help those who are suffering. Thank you for taking our blindness away so we can see all who suffer and who are in need. And as Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. 
Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When I was 13, I was messing around with some friends just outside the village gate when someone threw a rock and my head got in the way. That's using the old noggin. I don't really remember the impact or passing out. What I remember, what I'm not sure I'll ever forget, is opening my eyes to nothing. I couldn't see. Today, of course, they would have rushed me directly to the hospital, ran all the tests that they could, try to do whatever they could to fix it, but you have to remember, this was the first century. We didn't have those things back then. No, I knew pretty quickly that I was just going to have to live with it. That unless a miracle happened, I would be blind. My parents tried, of course. They did whatever they could. They took me to the village doctor, if you could even call him that. They even took me to the rabbi, but there wasn't much that he could do for me either. And though I couldn't see it in their faces, I could hear it in their voice, just how scared, how disappointed they were. See, from the time I was little, I always knew that my parents had a very specific purpose for me. They had an idea about who I was going to be in this world, and I didn't want to disappoint them. They had struggled to have me in the first place, and by the time they finally did, I think they knew it was just going to be me. And so, in the way that sometimes happens to only children, they poured everything they had into making me the model son. And I was happy to oblige. I did everything I could. Each year when we'd take our pilgrimage to Jerusalem, I would carry as much stuff as I could to just prove my worth in the family. Whenever they needed someone to work our booth in the market, I would go and do it happily. Anytime they needed help, I was there. Not that I was perfect. I never kept my tunic clean. I was the first to whine every time it was my turn to head to the well. But I tried really hard. And I knew my parents had big plans for me. From the time I was little, I remembered exactly what I was supposed to do with my life. They had told me from the beginning I would, just like my father and his father before him and his father before him, work the booth that we had in the marketplace. I knew what I was going to do. And I was so close to getting there. When I turned 13, my father gave me the cloak that had been passed down to him from his father, who had had it passed down to him from his father. It was the cloak that we wore on those big days of pilgrimage in the marketplace. It was the cloak that I was so proud of. Yeah, I know, it's weird to be excited about a cloak. But things were different then. We didn't have as much stuff. I had a tunic and some sandals and, well, that was it. I wore them until they wore out and then found something else. Not that we were poor, at least no poorer than the other people in Jericho those days, but we found our way. So when I got this cloak, none of my friends had a cloak. When I got this cloak, I wore it nonstop. For the first month, I wore it every single day until my mother found a stain on it and then told me from then on out it was only for special occasions. But on that month, I was a king. 
I would walk, strut up and down in front of the village gate. I would strut in front of my friends around the marketplace as if to say, look at me, me, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And then I got hit in the head with a rock. And people looked at me for a whole different reason. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments in life in which you've had something you thought you could count on suddenly ripped away from you. Your vision, your hearing, your sight, your relationship, your job, your sobriety. It's like you lose a piece of yourself. And it can happen so quickly. You're moving along in one direction, thinking you know exactly the path that is laid out for you. Suddenly, (coughs) the light goes out. You find yourself stumbling around in the darkness, sometimes quite literally. I guess some of us handle it better than others. My parents thought that the rock had taken more than my vision at first because I, in those first few weeks, didn't say a word. Just wanted to sleep and to cry. (coughs) When I finally did speaking, it started speaking, it wasn't anything kind. My friends would stop by to try and check on me, to see me, but I resented everything about them at that moment. Their vision, their sympathy, their future. And it didn't take long before they stopped coming around. I was so angry. My parents tried to get me to go outside to get some fresh air, but I refused. I couldn't stand the thought of someone looking at me and not knowing, and not being able to know. And I knew they'd be looking at me, I would. I said the most vile things to my parents, the two people in the world who loved me the most, who wanted nothing but the best for me, but I couldn't hear them. The day they told me they wanted to go to the temple for the high holy days, I refused. I told them right then and there, I don't believe in God anymore. Who could believe in a God who would let something like that happen to me? Me! I did all the right things. I was a good person. Over and over and over again, I kept playing out the future that I thought was in front of me. The path that I thought I was supposed to walk, the path that I had been promised to walk. But now, try as I might, I just couldn't see what was ahead. I couldn't see at all. People say that when you lose one sense, the others are heightened. I'm not sure if that's true, but I do know that when I lost my vision, my hearing did change. Just not for the better. Anytime my parents would check on me, I would just hear the disappointment in their voice. I would hear things that people weren't actually saying. Every time I went out, when I finally did go out, I could only hear the sympathy and the pity, and I didn't want to be someone that people felt sorry for. So finally, I just left. I took my cloak. I don't know why. And I left. For months, I stumbled around trying to find my way, 
till I stumbled into something that numbed the pain for a little while. Maybe you've been there. Makes you feel okay for a little bit. It takes away or at least dulls it so you can't feel the sting. But it doesn't last. My parents tried to find me, of course. They tried to help. God bless their souls. But at some level, we have to want to be helped. We have to see ourselves as worthy of being loved, and that was the thing I couldn't see. Those years were dark in more ways than one. I did things that I'm not proud of in order to survive, but I did survive, and eventually I found myself to the side of the road begging, which was how I was there on that day. By that time, that side of the road, that little spot, was mine. I'd been there for so long, it was mine. That made two things in this world that I owned. That spot and the cloak that I just couldn't let go of. By that time, it was torn to tatters, and yet I still had it with me, convinced that if I just held on to it tightly enough, that maybe that life that I had been promised would come back. That maybe I could finally get there. I heard he was coming long before he arrived. There had been murmurs going through. You'd be surprised what you can hear on the side of the road if no one really sees you. Even I, of course, had heard about Jesus of Nazareth, the rabbi who was out preaching good news to the poor, who was challenging the authorities. They even say that he was giving sight to the blind. I'll believe it when I see it, I used to say. But I didn't believe anything about him. I'd given up on God a long time before that, and I wasn't going to let any charlatan try to convince me that God was actually on my side when I knew for a fact that God had abandoned me a long time ago. And then it happened. Look, I don't really know even now how to describe it, how to explain what happened on that particular day. All I know is that suddenly I could tell that someone was looking at me. Just think about that for a moment. I could tell as a blind man, that someone was looking at me after years and years of never knowing, of not knowing whether people were looking at me or past me or even cared. Suddenly, I knew that someone was looking my way and not just looking at me, but seeing me like me. And what's even stranger is that suddenly I knew who it was. I knew who it was that was looking at me, not just to the world, but to me. I knew who this person was, and I cried out, Jesus, son of David. Nobody had ever called him that before. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I don't know if you've ever needed mercy. But I did. I needed someone who was going to forgive me, who was going to see past all that I had done, who was just going to see me for a moment. I needed mercy. And in all my years on the street, I had never begged for mercy, for coin, yes, for food, yes, but for mercy. And yet I knew somewhere deep down that that's what I needed. Now I would call it grace. That is, I needed someone to remind me of what it meant to be loved that I was worthy of love. I needed mercy. Now that he had seen me, I'd never wanted him to look away. And so I cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
The crowd, of course, started to push me away. It was inevitable. They always do that to hustle him by. And yet Jesus, to his credit, just kept looking. He never turned away. He never has. He called out. He, he called me to him. And for some reason in that moment, I just jumped up and I took off my cloak. I threw down this cloak that I had held on to for so long. I left the spot that had been my only place in this world. I left everything I knew behind and I ran right to him. And when he asked me, what do you want me to do for you? All I could think to say was help me see again. Only the thing is, I wasn't asking for my vision. I didn't even know that was possible. No, I was asking to see again to finally see a future, something ahead of me other than what I had been through, to finally see some hope, some light, some promise in this world, help me find my way. And somehow deep down I understood that this man could show it to me. And for the first time in a long time, I was right. Go, he said. Your faith has made you well. And in that moment, I could see again. My question for you, friends, is can you? Because whether you can or whether you can't, by the grace of God, there is one out there who sees you and who will never, ever turn away. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we open our hearts to you. Hear our prayers. We pray for each person in this world who in this moment is suffering. We pray for the healing of their body. 
mind, heart, and soul. We pray that all who are grieving know the comfort of your peace. And we pray for the souls of those who have died. We pray for all who are in hospice. And we pray for those who love and care for them. We pray for all persons who are in prison and we pray for those who love and miss them. We lift to you those who are lonely and in despair. We pray for ourselves and ask for your mercy for what we have done and for what we have not done. Remind us in our guilt and shame that you love us, regardless of our actions, thoughts, and words. Teach us your ways, so that what we do and think and say reflect only your love. Open our eyes to the ways you are working within and around us. Give us experiences that will strengthen our faith, renew our trust, and calm our fears. Give us the courage to accept the hand offered in reconciliation. Gracious, loving God, open our hearts to your peace. Open our ears to the laughter around us. Deepen our souls to feel you in all that we do. Strengthen our love so that it is your own love we feel for others and for ourselves. We ask that you make our words your words, our hearts your heart, and our breath your breath. Amen. If you have prayers that you would like to lift up to this congregation and with this congregation, we'd ask that you do so by taking one of the prayer cards in the, in the pew and placing it in one of the baskets on your way out, or if you're at home, by sending an email to prayers at asburyfirst.org, or by giving us a call so that we can stand with you and for you in prayer. We recognize in this moment that there are so many who are watching our service right now. There are 445 views from, whoop, Reese, hold on one second, just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, from some number of, okay, two countries and 23 states, sorry it took a moment to come up, but we recognize and say hello to those who are watching from Canada. <clears throat> And those who are watching from New York and Florida, Maine, Ohio, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Texas, Virginia, Delaware, Massachusetts, Kansas, hi mom and dad, Oklahoma, Arizona, Wyoming, Nebraska, North Carolina, Michigan, Connecticut, Maryland, Tennessee, New Jersey, Ontario. We hope that all of you find meaning in this moment. And for those who watch later, we pray that we can connect with you as well. We would love to know that you're out there and we'd love to know that you're here. So if you'll take a moment to sign in by the sheet that you found here, you can use your smartphone as well if you have that option. Or if you're at home, go to our website, asburyfirst.org and be able to check in there so that we can recognize your presence among us this morning. Following the service today, we will have about a five-minute break before then, and we will keep the live stream going. 
and after that, we will come for an open forum that the Governing Board has agreed graciously to host for today, and we're excited. So if you have questions, come and bring them so that we can talk together about how to be in community with one another. If you are one of those people out there who's been thinking about how do I take the next step into the life of this congregation, if you're a person out there who's been thinking, I'm ready to go a little deeper in my faith, if you're a person that has been looking for your people or someone to remind you in this world that you're not alone, I would invite you to consider joining one of the class meetings that we're beginning as a part of the Discipleship Project. There's more information about it in your bulletin on our website. You can speak with the Reverend Rachel DuPont and ask her questions about it. I would encourage you to do it. It is such a gift to be able to have people to share this journey of discipleship with. With that said, we recognize all the gifts that God has given us as we consider what we might give back to God. You can do so at home, asburyfirst.org slash give, and you can do so in the pews by placing something in the offering basket on your way out of the service today.
grace, use our offerings to provide refuge for the lost and mercy for those who suffer. May our gifts reach those who cry out in their need and who seek you with their whole heart. Amen. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, there's no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Go in the name of Jesus Christ and do more good. Amen.